don't school, whole school. Mr. Merston sent him to you know when he's, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, terrified by Mr. Creeple, the headmaster, uh, who, as the narrator says, has one eye. And the popular prejudice runs in favour of two. You know. <laughs> um, but this is this is a wonderful bit. And on the way to um, to the school, he stops in London, and he's, uh, a meal has been prepaid for him. And of course, he's very nervous because he's only a tiny bit more. The waiter bought me some chops and vegetables and took the covers off in such a bouncing manner that I was afraid I must have given him some offence. But he greatly relieved my mind by putting a chair for me at the table and saying very happily, Now, six foot, camel! I thanked him and took my seat up at the at the board, at the board, but found it extremely difficult to handle my knife and fork with anything like or to avoid splashing myself with the grain. After watching me into the second shop, he said, There's half a pint of ale for you. Will you have it now? I thanked him and said, Yes. Upon which he poured it out of a jug into a large tumbler and held it up against the light and made it look beautiful. My eye, he said. It seems a good deal, doesn't it? It does seem a good deal, I answered with a smile. For it was quite delightful for me to find him so pleasant. There was a gentleman here yesterday, he said, a stout gentleman by the name of Top Sawyer. Perhaps you know him. Uh, no, I said, I, I, I don't think he came in here, said the waiter, looking at the light through the tumbler, ordered a glass of this ale, would order it. I told him not, drank it, and fell down dead. <laughs> it was too old for him. It oughtn't to be drawn, that's the fact. I was very much shocked to hear this moment from the accident and said, I thought I had better have some water. Why, you see, said the waiter, still looking at the light through the tumbler with one of his eyes shut up, our people don't like things being ordered and left. It offends them. But I'll drink it if you like. I'm used to it. I don't think it'll hurt me if I throw my head back and take it all quick. Shall I? I replied that he would much oblige me by drinking it if he thought he could do it safely but by no means otherwise. When he did throw his head back and take it off quick, I had a horrible fear, I confess, of seeing him meet the fate of the lamented Mr. Topsoil and fall lifeless on the carpet. But it didn't hurt him. But on the contrary, I thought he seemed a fresher for him. What have we got here, he said, putting a fork into my dish. Not chops. Chops, I said. <laughs> oh, bless my soul, he exclaimed. Oh, I didn't know they were chops. Why? That chops have everything to take off the bad effects of that beer. Ain't that lucky? <laughs> so he took a chop by the bone in one hand and the potato in the other and ate away with a very good appetite, to my extreme satisfaction. He afterwards took another chop and another potato. And after that, another chop and another potato. When we had done, he brought me a pudding. And having set it before me, seemed to ruminate and to become absent in his mind for some moments. Uh, How's the pie? he said, rousing himself. It, it's a pudding, I made answer. Pudding? he exclaimed. Why, bless me, so it is. What? Looking at it nearer, you don't mean to say it's a batter pudding. Uh, yes, it is indeed. Why, a batter pudding, he said, taking up a tablespoon. It's my favourite pudding. Ain't that lucky? Come on, little one, and let's see who'll get most. The waiter, certainly. He entreated me more than once to come in and win, but what with his tablespoon and my teaspoon, his dispatch to my dispatch, and his appetite to my appetite, I was left far behind at the first mouthful and had no chance with him. I never saw anyone enjoy pudding so much, I think. And he laughed when it was all gone, as if his enjoyment of it lasted still. <laughs> well, I'm the greatest Englishman of the 19th century, Bob. If anybody can be called a Shakespeare, the one that looks What do you do about him, though? You cannot get kids to read a 900 page novel. Uh, you know, and uh, a lot of the best Dickens novels are 900. I mean, David Copperfield, about 850 pages, which will dollar 800 pages. Lee uh, House, 900. Uh, yep, easily. Our mutual friend. Now, 
I, and the only thing I managed to do um, uh, uh, with, with prep school boys, I never had to teach Dickens for um, a level, never set. Um, but I, with very clever boys, I used to do a sort of cut version of half time, which was the shortest Dickens novel. And I gave them chapters to read, uh, selected chapters to read. And um, some of them asked what had happened in the chapters that they had read. And that worked very well. But I used to say to them, now look, you know, you, you, you cannot not read some Dickens, but the thing is that you, you've got to be prepared to skip. You know, you cannot read a Dickens novel all at the same pace. You go mad. If you read 800 pages at equal, equal intensity, uh, a Dickens like Shakespeare often wrote terrible stuff. And you, when you get to a bit that's terrible, you just have to run your line down the page and just get, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm, okay. When you get to a bit that looks as though it's interesting, stop and slow down. The only way you can read it um, now, and it's better than nothing. Um, but it's a real problem. Dickens, not to read Dickens is to miss out on all the great pleasures of life. Um, but there's, there's so much of him, and so much of it is terrible, and you, you've got to be prepared to, um, to, you know, be very your, your speed and your degree of attention. But it's a real problem what to do about Dickens. I mean, you can see from this, you know, if, if you read the first chapter of Great Expectations to anybody of any age, they immediately want to read the whole novel. Um, but there's 500 pages of it. <laughs> so, um, that's a pedagogical problem we haven't solved yet. Um, C.S. Calvary. Well, 